we are um, celebrating Swami Vivekananda's birthday today. Uh, it was a few days ago by the um, lunar calendar. And this is always confusing. Uh, somebody said yesterday, oh, my friend's birthday coincides with Swami Vivekananda's birthday then. I said only once this, this time, not next year. <laughs> well, the English calendar, it is uh, the 12th of January. Because you calculate by the lunar cal uh, calendar, the, the tithi, the date of the birthday, keeps changing from year to year in the English calendar. Uh, a gentleman who's very close to us, who works at the United Nations, he said uh, to me that, yes, yes, I understand the, the lunar calendar uh, because my wife is South Korean and she calculates her birthday by the lunar calendar. It drives me crazy because her birthday is different every day, every year. <laughs> it's very important for us here in the Vedanta Society of New York. Swami Vivekananda established this Vedanta Society of New York in 1894. So we have this remarkable legacy. It was established, in fact, five years before uh, Belurmat itself. Swami Vivekananda did a great deal of his, uh, of his work here in New York, in the Vedanta Society of New York, in you know, the Raja Yoga, publication of the Raja Yoga, translation and publication of the Raja Yoga, um, the first edition of the Jnana Yoga, uh, the, Bhak the Karma Yoga, the uh, great author Salinger, J.D. Salinger said, these are two delightful classics, these are two classics, two little classics, Karma Yoga and Raja Yoga, which our American youth would do well to carry around in their pockets. <laughs> so these books were actually first written here and they were published from here. Uh, I think even the first edition of Bhakti Yoga also was published from, from the Vedanta Society of New York. The logo of the Ramakrishna Mission, which is very familiar, uh, it was designed here, in fact. Um, once uh, they're going to print a pamphlet. In those days, Swami Vivekananda's lectures here in New York were printed and distributed in pamphlets. And the printer, who was a devotee, he came to Swami Vivekananda one mo morning where Swami Vivekananda was at the breakfast table and said, uh, Swamiji, we need a logo to go with this. Can you design something? And on the back of an envelope, Swami Vivekananda there and then he sketched out this thing and he said, and he, then he said, the description is he tossed it across the table and he said, uh, draw it to scale and print it. So that was, that's what we use today. In fact, it's right here, I think the logo of the Ramakrishna order, and so on. So what is the subject today? What are we going to talk about um, this morning? The subject, as you saw, is very general. Swami Vivekananda's uh, teachings, Vedanta teachings. What I'm going to talk about is the old and the new in Vedanta, in Vedanta and in Vivekananda. Why this subject? It's because I've noticed that here in the West, in fact, why only West? Now in the, in the modern world, everywhere it is the same. In academia, the fashion is that uh, unless you say something new, you can't make your mark. You, you get published only by claiming that what you are saying and writing is new. Nobody got it right earlier. You are the first person who's saying this for the first time. Everybody who has talked about it in this area is a fool and they all got it wrong and you are setting it right for the first time and so on. Maybe I'm exaggerating, but by not by much. Um, there's a reason why there is, this is so. In fact, I remember Professor J.N. Mahanti, who is a very well-known philosopher, master of both Indian and Western philosophy, who taught here in the United States for many decades. He said once that he had met Hannah Arendt and Hannah Arendt, maybe here in New York itself, Hannah Arendt told him that this great difference between the ancient Greek and the ancient Indian outlook is, the ancient Greek out outlook was that something comes out of nothing. So there's always the possibility of new things coming. And the new is always new and better. Whereas uh, the ancient Indian outlook was something comes out of something. So whatever is coming, its roots are there. The source is behind it. The reality is behind it. It's emerging from something which was there already existing. Maybe that's the philosophy uh, why today new, uh, new publication, new idea, that is important. Um, before I go into this, 
just by the way, knowledge is by definition new. Even in Vedanta, one of the terms used to define knowledge is uh, prama, valid knowledge is um, anadigata. That which has not been known earlier is now known. So knowledge is always new, whether it's in the East or the West. But what is meant there is different from what, what we are talking about. What is meant in the Vedantic sense of knowledge being new is, for me, when I read Vedanta, when I study and when I practice spiritual disciplines, I get this new realization. But it doesn't mean it's new for, for Vedanta. It's not new for the civilization. It's not new for the Vedas. It's been there. I learn it. Just like it's new knowledge for me, only when I go to school and study the textbooks and attend the classes, that doesn't mean it's new for the professor or for uh, the discipline itself. Uh, it's it's uh, established and well known. So in that sense. Um, whereas the Indian tradition has always been, and I'm talking not about all kinds of knowledge, I'm talking about spiritual knowledge here. Uh, spiritual and maybe philosophical knowledge. The Indian tradition has been um, that uh, whatever you say uh, to be valid, it has to be based on an authentic spiritual tradition. It must be the ex expression of an established spiritual tradition. Shankaracharya goes so far as to say, Asampradayavit um, murkha, sarva shastra vidovavi murkha vad upekshaniya. That's Sanskrit for, that's polite Sanskrit for, <laughs> The person who is not learned in the tradition, who does not know the tradition, even if this person has read all the books in the library, should, this person should be disregarded as a fool, doesn't know anything. Uh, in fact, these days, it is uh, people do not know. Sometimes spiritual teachers, modern spiritual teachers, I've seen in, the, in India too, they make radical claims like, Oh, it is my realization I'm talking about. I'm not talking about somebody else's, what, whatever they said in the books. I don't read books. Uh, I, am, uh, I discovered this for myself. It is new. I'm giving you something absolutely new. And they find followers. That's why I'm saying this is a trend all over the world. That uh, the latest and the newest must be somehow the best. So um, what I'm telling you is new. It is entirely my own. They don't realize how utterly stupid how utterly they discredit themselves in the eyes of traditional learning. I remember this monk, and this is a story which I read. Um, so some, some enthusiast went and said to a monk in the Himalayas that, you know, my teacher, my guru has said these things which are not there in the shastras, uh, uh, in the tr traditional teaching. And uh, the monk said, I'll tell you in Hindi and translate, Kahe apne guru ko gali deta hai? Why, why are you cursing, insulting your own guru? It's an insult to say that. People don't realize. Today they take it as a matter of great credit. I am absolutely original. And absolutely stupid. That's from the Indian perspective. So from the Indian perspective what happens? See both sides have their advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of uh, this modern approach, I would not say again a western approach because it's all over the world now. And it's also not Western in that sense, because uh, the, if you go back a couple of hundred years ago, the entire tradition in Judaism and in Christianity was a commentarial tradition, that it comes from um, down a lineage of prophets and teachers, and we are commenting on it and so on. But it's a modern tradition, uh, or, or a modern approach, that the new must be necessarily better, and it must be more authentic. Uh, maybe it's the model of progress in scientific knowledge, where newer things are discovered and so the old things are dis uh, discarded. But that's not necessarily true or valid about spiritual uh, knowledge. Um, both sides have their advantages and disadvantages. What is the uh, advantage of this modern approach is that there's always the possibility of new discovery. There's always the possibility of a new and better approach. There's always the possibility of, of uh, adapting something to modern circumstances. Uh, things change, and so knowledge must change accordingly. That's the advantage. The disadvantage is that often, and I know this from personal experience, we read, you know, I, I enthusiastically read the latest articles on areas of my interest in philosophy, in Vedanta especially, Indian philosophy especially, new articles. Often they are not worth the paper they are written on. Uh, only by claiming to be new, to get it published, 
Uh, they make huge claims, and then it's, when you see what is there, it's either a rehash of what is all, what was already there, or uh, it is uh, superficial, or it is just plain wrong. Uh, in just in the eagerness to be published as something new and original, often uh, it's not worthwhile. The endeavor itself is not worthwhile. It's a waste of time. That's the disadvantage. The traditional approach again has its strengths and disadvantages. The traditional approach of uh, there is this truth I find in the Upanishads. Now I'm commenting, writing commentaries upon it and sub-commentaries upon it and sub-sub-commentaries upon it. The great disadvantage of that approach, of course, one uh, is one can clearly see it might simply become uncreative and unoriginal after some time, just ornamental. Uh, it might rob us of the power of thinking, thinking ori uh, original thoughts. I remember one great pandit from whom I studied Nyaya, and I was uh, very, uh, you know, impressed to see the capacity of these traditional pandits to, m you know, memorize entire texts. And they were so well grounded in their area of study. I was talking specifically of Nyaya philosophy. Um, compared to what I saw the products of our modern school, college, university system. So I was telling this pandit, I am so, this uh, traditional learning is, is very impressive. But that, that pandit told me, that is true. But at the same time, uh, we lack critical thinking. So we tend to you know, master the texts, really do it really, really well. But then to think for oneself once again about it, uh, that capacity sometimes disappears. Why I'm bringing all this up is, last year, uh, in a class at Harvard, when, Swam, uh, when um, a professor, Parimal Patil, was introducing his class on classical Indian um, Buddhist philosophy. Um, so, imagine, all the students were, there were no other Indian student except myself, and they're all graduates in philosophy, in, uh, especially trained in modern Western philosophy. So he started by saying that this distinction we are making between the traditional commentarial approach, the old text and you write commentaries and sub-commentaries and sub-commentaries upon it, and this new approach of telling, saying that I'm saying something new for the first time. Uh, and so he sort of scolded the students saying that don't be dismissive of the commentarial approach. Don't think that it's all useless because, oh, you're just writing newer and newer commentaries on this. It's the same, uh, what, old wine in new bottles? The same thing you're saying all over again. It's not worth looking at. No, no, no. Don't do that. Um, he said that this distinction between old and new is not correct. What I said till now, uh, that's Professor Patil said this is not a valid distinction. Why? Often. Why? Uh, he said that um, when you look at the, the old masters in um, Buddhist philosophy or in Vedanta, in Indian philosophy, they had their way of saying new things. So he gave an example. So he, this person is writing a commentary on, um, on another master who lived centuries ago who wrote a commentary on the Buddha's teachings. And now he wants to disagree with this master. So what does he say? Um, the great Sankhapa, in all his omniscient wisdom, has come up with this out of his creative genius, meaning thereby, he's not saying anything good. He's saying that he invented it. It's not something that the Buddha said. Uh, now I want to give you this new idea. So he is saying something new. He is being critical. And he is making a change. It's just that the format is of a, of a sub-commentary on another commentary. On the other hand, he said, look at um, uh, Western thinkers, Western philosophers who claim originality. But if you look deeply, they are always, all the time, even by criticizing their predecessors, they are building on their predecessors. Yeah. If you um, look at Sartre or Heidegger, you will find behind them Nietzsche. If you look at Nietzsche, you will find behind Nietzsche is uh, Hegel and Schopenhauer and behind that is Kant and uh, behind that are the scholastics of, uh, you know, the Catholic theologians and behind that are the um, Greek philosophers. It, it is presented as if entirely new, but it is built upon the, like the shoulders of giants. So that is also a kind of commentary. Fine. All this was by the way of introduction. <laughs> So what we will do now is bring this to bear upon Swami Vivekananda's presentation of Vedanta, the old and the new. What is old, what is new 
in uh, Swami Vivekananda's presentation of Vedanta. Swami Vivekananda himself said that my mission in life can be put in a few words. It is to preach unto humanity their inner divinity and how to make it manifest in every movement of life. Look at the words. To preach unto uh, humanity their inner divinity and how to make it manifest in every movement of life. Every word is important. Another place, very well-known definition of religion. Each soul is potentially divine. And the goal is to manifest this divinity already within us. And then you do it by, you know, by work or worship or uh, philosophy or devotion, one or more or all of these, and be free. That is the whole of religion. Uh, books, temples, doctrines, churches are secondary details and so on. But notice the words. The key words are the manifestation of the divinity already within us. So this is the first thing which Swami Vivekananda says, that there is a divinity within us. This is how he presents Vedanta. What is he saying here? In traditional Advaita Vedanta, which we have studied, an inquiry into ourselves, the claim is that we are one with the absolute reality, the ultimate reality of the universe. There is an ultimate reality. And that ultimate reality is you, Tattva Masi. That is the traditional formulation. In the Upanishads you find that thou art. Now, if I am that ultimate reality, my first reaction is that I don't know about it. And then we all know, we have talked about it for, you know, forever. This <laughs> That has been the theme of um, not only my talks here, but the whole Vedanta society for the last 126, 27 years. We've been talking about this divinity within ourselves. It is, you have to engage in a process of inquiry. And what I know about myself we start off by, yes, obviously there's this body and then uh, not just the body, uh, we, um, the, the mind is there, the personality. And Vedanta teaches us in various ways to inquire within ourselves. Inquire means to take a look. They will give us the instructions, the Upanishads and the Vedanta texts. Tell us how to do it. You listen to that and carefully track it, follow it. In our own experience, when you attend to our own experience, there's a philosophical fancy word for it. It's called a phenomenological approach. Phenomenological approach means how reality appears to us right now. You just attend to that. Quite distinct from believing in something later, uh, after death somewhere, or somewhere else like heaven. That's a different kind of approach. That's a dualistic, devotional, faith-based approach. There is also a mystical approach. When you sit and meditate and you get extraordinary experiences. But the way of Advaita Vedanta was to attend to experience right now. What experience? We have talked about it. Drik Drishya. The experience of subject and object. I am the experiencer and here is the world of experience. And you follow this and go inwards. And the I am the seer. And what I see is an object. So I look at the world, that's an object. Look at the body, that's an object. Look at the mind itself is an object. These are now amazing new revelations to us because we always thought, I am the mind. I am the mind in a body, that's it. We never e examine that. But then the mind itself is an object or a series of subtle objects. Yeah. And so in Vaidrik Drishya Viveka, we come to this idea that there is an awareness at my core, core of my existence is an awareness. That awareness is my real nature, but uh, we can just say that my, my deeper nature is that awareness. It's easier to grasp than immediately to abandon that I am not the body, not the mind, I am that awareness. That's a little difficult. But let's say I am, I, I first of all discover that such an awareness is there. It has always been there. The same thing you discover in Taittiriya Upanishad by the traditional method of the five sheets, the five layers of the human personality. Here is the physical layer, the Annamaya Kosha. And we notice inside that there is a layer of prana, of life, pranamaya Kosha. You notice then there is a layer of thoughts, deeper, more subtle, inwards. Inwards to the body is the life processes. Inwards to the life processes is the layer of thoughts, emotions, memories. Uh, which we identified with ourselves, but we see they are also objects. Just like this body is an object, those thoughts are also objects, subject to continuous change. Look inwards, you find the layer of um, uh, the sheath of intellect, which we are using right now to understand all these things. That's also something, it's also a subtle thing. Push inwards, further inwards, and the Upanishad says there is the Anandamaya Kosha, the bliss, the bliss sheath which is a clue which we get in deep sleep, for example. 
and as a as the knower the observer the illuminator the experiencer of these five sheets and through these five sheets we experience the world is it same awareness which i talked about same thing we find in the mandukya upanishad Now just attend to your experience of waking dreaming deep sleep and notice that when we go from waking to dreaming to deep sleep huge changes there the whole world goes away and there's a world of dreams that goes away there is blankness not only the world even more stunning my physical body goes away you see in the other methods drik drishya vivek or panchakosha viveka the body is a constant it's still there but when you look at our waking dreaming and deep sleep i continue as a knowing subject as an experiencer and i lose experience of my physical body what a remarkable thing that it is there on the on the bed something that i hold on to so closely in a moment it's gone entirely from my consciousness if you say that i become unconscious i have no experience and therefore i do not experience the body that is something i can accept that but imagine the remarkable nature of dreams where i continue as an experiencer as a knowing subject and yet i have no idea of my body no experience of my body lying on the bed so that the world disappears before my eyes the body disappears before my uh, experience and then it is replaced by dreams that also disappears my whole way of looking at the world as i am a subject and i know an object this world or the world of dreams this whole subject object thing also disappears in in deep sleep and i come back again by this method i discover the same awareness the same awareness which is experiencing all of this this awareness is free of the world is free of the body is free of the thoughts feelings memories emotions personality this is immortal awareness problems are in the world problems are in body problems are in emotions in mind in intellect also there are problems and the seed of all problems seed of all dukkha is in the ananda maya in the in the causal state deep sleep because it comes back again but the consciousness which transcends all of them there no problem there death is of the body that is not of the consciousness this immortal problem free consciousness this consciousness in itself what does it want suppose you try something like this right now that imagine the world outside has disappeared it's all covered with snow and buried gone and then close your eyes and you see the room also disappears there's nobody else around and then you think that the body itself has disappeared no physical body just a mass of thoughts no perceptions you don't see anything here smell taste touch anything now imagine all memories have disappeared no memories now imagine all thoughts ideas disappeared and you are aware will be aware of what will be like nothing now drop that nothing also suppose and just awareness the light of awareness which is always there that awareness what does it want what does it need what demands does it have nothing it's perfectly fulfilled it's always there all problems and all demands and desires and lack of fulfillment they come when the mind starts working and then the when the mind attends to itself and then to the body and to the world then these things start up now that consciousness in itself ever free immortal um ever uh, pure impurity and purity they come with the body mind ever satisfied ever beyond sorrow this is called the divinity of the soul this is what swami vivekananda means he used the word the divinity within us so we already have it and the whole point is to discover this uh, reality not only this thing the second big thing which swami vivekananda uh, taught about vedanta was how many such divinities are there our first reaction would be that all right so i am such an awareness and there are many such awarenesses plurality of awarenesses in all living beings in each body mind there will be one such awareness that would be the sankhyan point of view but swami vivekananda talked about the oneness of all existence 
it is one awareness in the bhagavad gita vedanta says in bhagavad gita krishna says kshetragyam chaapi mam vidhi sarva kshetreshu bharata uh, know me alone to be the one awareness in all beings now look god is saying that this awareness which you we discover within yourself it is the same awareness in all beings and this one awareness in all beings in and through all beings shining in in, in and through all minds is is god and it is one one of the hymns by which we had when we sing to sri ramakrishna buddhes cha sakshi nikhilasya janto nachayasya vetta yo vetti sarvam the witness of the mind the witness of the intellect where in all living beings who knows all whom nobody knows that we salute as sri ramakrishna but what is that sri ramakrishna it is you your own inner reality and there the entire universe is one and the external physical world and the so many bodies they are all like waves in an ocean they are all appearances in one reality this is what swami vivekananda calls the oneness of all existence he is vedanta which he taught with a lion's roar here in the west and in india is this two is built on two planks one is the divinity within us and the second one is the oneness of all existence the divinity which within each one of us already there already perfect waiting to be discovered or as he said manifested and the oneness of all existence this is vedanta according to swami vivekananda just one little uh, in observation here so this reality i am brahman discovering this so this is what is vedanta this is traditional vedanta swami vivekananda adds a little wrinkle on this a little ornamentation a little little change in this he does not say knowing the divinity within yourself he says manifesting the divinity within yourself my ideal is to preach unto humanity their inner divinity and how to make it manifest in every movement of their life in every movement of life how to make it manifest that means in our thinking in our speaking and in our daily activities see this is where you can see the clear connection sri ramakrishna and swami vivekananda sri ramakrishna whenever he practiced any kind of spirituality he would bring it down practice it to the most basic bodily level also renunciation of wealth he threw coins into the river <laughs> this clay and coins taka mati mati taka so some jokester said oh he knew how valuable property is going to be that's why he said <laughs> clay is money money is clay <laughs> he knew that land is going to be valuable <laughs> no so he practiced it when he wanted to erase every consciousness of caste superiority um or any kind of superiority over others he went and wiped the the latrin uh, of a sweeper physically he did it wiping it with his long matted hair now this is what swami vivekananda means by the manifestation of divinity the manifestation of divinity does not only include realizing oh i am not the body not the mind chidananda roopa shivoham i am pure consciousness i am the nature of shiva that's one part of it the other part of it is fearlessness love for everybody unselfishness you know unconditional love unselfishness um discipline self control natural self control uh, all of the qualities of a saint they should come into our lives that is the manifestation of the divinity this is the full meaning of the word manifestation i always thought why did swami vivekananda use the word manifestation of the divinity already within us why not knowledge of the divinity already within us so it must be expressed it must bear fruit in our lives above all swami vivekananda was a practical spiritualist he was a practical vedantist it must have practical benefits right now in our lives i must be able to solve my problems and the problems of others he said otherwise he said i have no interest in such a religion you know he's which cannot wipe the widow's tears in this life and promises heaven after death I cannot give a loaf of bread to the hungry now and promises heaven after death i do not believe in such a religion so i very kind very strong why manifestation the nature of enlightenment is a paper i read last year you wouldn't think that professors in harvard are interested in enlightenment but <laughs> there is a discussion one interesting paper is really struck me 
two models of enlightenment. So this professor was writing about, uh, it's a paper on uh, enlightenment in Buddhism, in Tibetan Buddhism. Two models of enlightenment. One is called the paradigm shift model. The other one is called the ethical manifestation model. So what is the paradigm shift model? Uh, I, in the Buddhist paradigm, the, I realize the emptiness of the world. I, I get pragya, the wisdom, which enables me to reach nirvana. Um, I realize my true nature. In Vedanta it would be, I realize myself as Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi. I am infinite existence, consciousness, bliss. This is the paradigm shift. I am not body, not mind. And this is not a material universe. I realize the divinity within myself and the oneness of this divinity. This is paradigm shift. But what is ethical manifestation? Ethical manifestation is love for others. The complete, uh, he, Swami Vivekananda's language, self-abnegation, complete unselfishness, expressed in service, uh, complete removal of fear, fearlessness. So, the manifestation of the qualities of a Buddha in our life, that is called the ethical manifestation model. Now, I was just thinking the word manifestation used by Swami Vivekananda has both of these. The paradigm shift and the ethical manifestation. Both of these are, are there in Swami Vivekananda's model of spirituality. As we go on the path of Vedanta, we must gather more and more of this realization that I am not the body and mind, I am the witness consciousness. I am free of problems. Actually, not as a slogan. To actually see that, yes, there is, at least there is a spiritual depth in me which is free of the problems. That, that I must admit. Then, next, is at this, as we go along, these qualities of unselfishness, of strength, of fearlessness, of love for others, yeah. of the control of the senses, these must manifest, even before realization, must go must start manifesting. And after realization also, a perfect manifestation of these qualities. So this is called... Uh, manifestation of the divinity. Full manifestation of divinity means knowledge of the divinity and also the qualities. The qualities which go along with it. What is old and what is new? So Sister Nivedita, in her masterful introduction to the complete works of Swami Vivekananda, says all these things, which I have just now, till now I have said, all these things would have been true even if Vivekananda had never lived. All these Gita, Upanishad, everything would have been there. As much valid and she says, the word she uses is as much authentic, even if Vivekananda had not come. Then what is new in Vivekananda? And she says, of course, the ease of access and the presentation, how Vivekananda presents it, that is a very wonderful thing which he has done. But there is something unique which he has given. Here now we are going from old to new. We must see. What is the new thing? And Sister Nivedita puts it so powerfully that uh, uh, instead of paraphrasing her words, I would like to quote the original. The word, her original words are powerful, accurate, and sort of breathtaking in the vista she opens up before us. So what she says, It must never be forgotten that it was the Swami Vivekananda who, while proclaiming the sovereignty of the Advaita philosophy, which we just talked about now, as including the experience in which all is one without a second, also added to Hinduism here, the doctrine that Dvaita, Vishishta Dvaita and Advaita are but three phases or stages in a single development in which the last named Advaita, in which the last named constitutes the goal. This is part and parcel of the still before I go on. So here is already a big contribution. Without Vivekananda, without Sri Ramakrishna, if you look at the philosophical scene in India, a thousand years of conflict from Shankaracharya's time down to about 18, in one sense, still continuing, that is Advaita superior, is Advaita right, or Dvaita right, or Vishishta Dvaita right? There are wonderful masters who have written enormous and sophisticated and deep dialectical texts attacking and defending for a thousand years. So, that is wonderful, be that as it may, because it has led to the development of philosophy. That's great. But ultimately, at the end of it, where do we stand? Here is the beautiful insight that this is a series of developments. And we remember here 
what Sri Ramakrishna approved of, you know, Hanuman saying that, as body I am the servant and you, Rama, are my Lord. As the jiva, sentient being, you are the whole, I am thy part. And as pure consciousness, you and I are one reality. And these three are my firm conviction. So, <laughs> Dvaita, Vishishta, Dvaita, Dvaita. Uh, so, this is, this is one great, is, uh, the significance of this cannot be overruled. Uh, till now it is not fully accepted. This, and that's the sign of something new. It takes time to be accepted. But you, the truth of this actually strikes you directly when you think about it. Yes, it must be so. Then she goes on, much more remarkable. This is part and parcel of the still greater and more simple doctrine that the many and the one are the same reality, perceived by the mind at different times and in different attitudes. Or as Sri Ramakrishna expressed the same thing, God is both with form and without form. And he is that which includes both form and formlessness. As you dig deeper into Vivekananda, you begin to see he is, it is Ramakrishna and Ramakrishna throughout. Only from the surface, scholars will see, see, Ramakrishna said something, Vivekananda made these changes. If you dig deeper, you will just see it is, it is almost like Vivekananda is a shell through which Ramakrishna is shining forth. And Sister Nivedita says that this thing, which she just said, I am quoting again, it is this which adds its crowning significance to our master's life. Here, our, by our master, she means Vivekananda. For here, why is this so important? What she says is breathtaking. For here, he becomes the meeting point, not only of East and West, but also past and future. If the one and the many be indeed the same reality, then it is not only all modes of worship alone, but equally all modes of work, all modes of struggle, all modes of creation, which are paths of realization. No distinction henceforth between sacred and secular. To labor is to pray. To conquer is to renounce. Life is itself religion. To have and to hold is as stern a trust as to quit and to avoid. This is the realization which makes Vivekananda the great preacher of karma, not as divorced from, but as expressing jnana and bhakti. It's the old conflict between knowledge, devotion and action. It is all synthesized into one, one vision. To him, Vivekananda, the workshop, the study, the farmyard and the field are as true and fit scenes for the meeting of God with man as the cell of the monk or the door of the temple. To him, there is no difference between service of man and worship of God, between manliness and faith, between true righteousness and spirituality. All, these, all, his, all his words, from one point of view, can be read as a commentary upon this central conviction. This is Sister Nivedita, to be taken very seriously. She says all that Vivekananda taught. It's very difficult to reconcile because it seems contradictory at times. He says all that Vivekananda taught can be read as commentary on this central conviction, which is, which is what, he, what she just said. He said, Vivekananda said, art, science and religion are but three different ways of expressing a single truth. But... In order to understand this, we must have the theory of Advaita. See, that last part is also important. Otherwise, we may run into a superficial, a facile way of saying, well, whatever we do is religion, whatever we do is spirituality. No, 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 it is not. Yeah. It can be spiritualized. For this, this you need this vision. This is actually what uh, you know, Ayan Maharaj is driving at when he talk, talks about the Vijnana Vedanta of Sri Ramakrishna. It's a breathtaking vi uh, vision. I just, um, it's thrilling to think about how East and West ideals of both have come together in Vivekananda. How the entirety of tradition, 5,000 years of spiritual tradition in India, I'm not just saying Vedanta, also other traditions, including Buddhism, I say, all of it have come together in Vivekananda, but he's not about the past. He's about bringing the light of that past to bear on the present and on centuries to come. The vision of 
society of religion and spirituality which he has got is is we still have not understood it it is too vast for us to begin to, i think it is a program for the future it's a program for the future of not only religion not only philosophy ethics but of civilization itself i remember last year uh, i met this young vietnamese researcher um very intelligent young man very articulate deep thinker he was he's doing research in um, management theory on work he's doing his phd and he was working in boston college and i was at harvard at that time he called me and he said that i want he, i want to talk to you about vivekananda and we had set up a meeting and he said to me that he didn't know anything about vivekananda he had no particular interest in hinduism or india or anything like that he said while studying some of the greatest and noblest ideas in management theory work human relationships goal of human life what will motivate a person in this modern age uh, the role of money the role of inspiration uh, all, all of these things he's studying he says everywhere the highest and noblest ideas he found at work in modern society he says they all are traced back to one name kept coming up again and again and again in the late 19th century swami vivekananda he said who is this person he started studying and he was very very impressed so he wanted to talk to me and he's doing work i hope he will publish books so soon uh, i felt that behind the creation of our modern age this may sound like a, like a too big an assertion but i'm convinced behind the foundation of our modern age and the age that is to come is vivekananda and behind him of course is sri ramakrishna a great force has been unleashed it's not that all of it has come from vivekananda these forces are floating around in in human thought they coalesce into a force once in a while expressed in society what are some of the implications quickly i'll touch on and remain time remaining to me a few areas the area of um, spiritual practice the area of ethics area of the religion so how do we realize all these things what we're talking about the way to realize all these things is called yoga yoga is a spiritual path and here i want to touch upon another aspect of what is old and what is new once again we are asking what is old and what is new in swami vivekananda teaching of vedanta so we come to the area of spiritual practice of the yogas what is the question here where well, if you look at spiritual practices there's a wide range of spiritual practices in hinduism and in other religions also you can meditate meditation is so popular now that also to a great extent is due to vivekananda meditation is so popular there is devotion very common worship prayer uh, there is much less known uh, spiritual investigation i mean it's uh, in a philosophical investigation to spirituality the path of gyana i remember a monk people are confused about it a monk a senior monk in belur mat one day saying what are you studying philosophy i said yes oh what is the use of studying philosophy this is uh, you know you have to for god realization what is the use of studying philosophy i quoted vivekananda back to him i said do it by work or psychic control or philosophy he uses the word philosophy for gyana yoga that is the truest sense of philosophy you see why this wrong idea is there uh, and it's understandable even when we studied philosophy in uh, uh, when we were novices in belur mat i remember the gentleman who used to come and teach us he was a retired professor of philosophy uh, nirod babu he was a disciple of swami avedananda fat little man fiery with the huge eyes and the booming voice and he would walk pace back and forth on the platform and yell at us we were we were brahmacharis and he'd say please be careful maharaj and he said be careful this is philosophy in the western philosophy philosophy is teaching us western philosophy philosophy is philosophy a love of wisdom it is thinking about philosophical subjects it is not darshana darshana is the seeing or the realization of the ultimate reality which you thought uh, which you read in you know vedanta sankhya the indian traditions so making in our minds that is a clear distinction between the indian approach 
and the western approach i always felt uncomfortable with it but anyway he is a great authority so he is saying it must be true and it's true the word philosophy and if you look at the textbooks they are thinking the thinking intellectually thinking about philosophical topics until last year i came across this little book the history of um, thought by luc ferry who is a french philosopher and uh, he was the minister of education in france i think only in france philosophers are edu- uh, are elevated to high positions i asked a philosopher uh, once uh, last year he was uh, he was french uh, but french canadian uh, what accounts for the importance of philosophy in france uh, he one reason he said that it start from school days uh, it's it's a subject in india it's disappearing in, even in college and university everybody wants to be computer engineer or doctor or something like that nobody wants to be a philosopher so it's disappearing from colleges and universities in india in france it is taught in school and of course university anyway luc ferry wrote this book full of insights wonderful if you read it you will get the feeling that nobody no english speaking person has ever done philosophy there's absolute contempt for english speaking philosophers you know contempt in sense he doesn't criticize he simply ignores if you look at the bibliography the books to be read not a single english american philosopher australian philosopher is there all the books are french or german writers greek and then french or german that's it anyway but what what insight did i get one of the insights i got was this is not philosophy that's not the right word theory theory is the right word for what we do so what is theory it is the root of theory is theon orao seeing of divinity exact meaning of darshana anyway that's just just an aside i wanted to share with you so um philosophy is to realize god so gyana yoga bhakti yoga karma yoga raja yoga these are the different yogas and different spiritual paths that swami vivekananda spoke about what is old and what is new what did swami vivekananda do in this field here is the old that the traditional approach which is perfectly all right and which by the way because i'm going to go beyond it i'm i'm now making myself my position secure by saying i believe in it entirely and i'm entirely grounded in it if you ask me questions i'll give you answers from this traditional perspective but still we must see what vivekananda did the traditional perspective is from advaita vedanta you are brahman and our reaction is that's cool but i don't know it i don't feel it what's the point of saying such things i have no idea what you're talking about that is called ignorance so in advaita vedanta they say the purpose of spiritual practice what is the purpose of spiritual practice to remove the misconception the the wrong idea that you are not brahman it is not to make you brahman you are already brahman to remove the ignorance about um, your yourself i do not know that i am brahman I, it doesn't make any sense to me good you are on the right path this is called ignorance and we have the medicine for it we have already s- displayed the correct symptom now here is the vaccine for it <laughs> hmm. so the vaccine is what knowledge for ignorance the vaccine is knowledge and ignorance of the self knowledge about the self and now we are on sure ground here are the upanishads here are the other vedanta texts which tell you about and you can now we will tell you about drig drishya viveka and panchakosha viveka and the, the analysis of the three states the five sheets the seer in the scene so on and there is a method to it there is a course of treatment which is hearing med, uh, reflecting and meditating shravana manana niridhyasana this is called gyana yoga but then we complain i have been attending classes as, as somebody said um, i have been attending classes before you are born swami and i am still not enlightened all right vedanta says that there is another layer of problems what is the layer second layer of problem first layer of problem ignorant mind second layer of problem restless mind mind is unable to grasp the teachings this is in sanskrit it is called vikshepa and the solution for ig- uh, restless mind is focus concentration ekagrata in sanskrit and there is a method for it and that method is called upasana upasana in, in it's basically literally it means worship but you can see it includes elements of yoga and bhakti devotion and meditation well there also we have a um, uh, we have an objection i have taken mantra diksha uh, and i do meditation morning and evening no good 
no concentration of mind mind is uh, is either sleepy or it's restless third layer of problem vedanta says you're still on the course no problem <laughs> third layer of spiritual problem what is that impure mind ignorant mind restless mind impure mind in sanskrit chitta mala and the solution for impurity of mind is of course purity of mind and it's one word that we keep hearing in vedanta chitta shuddhi purification of the mind all spiritual practices first of all they must accomplish purification of the mind and here one powerful way of accomplishing purification of the mind is karma yoga all work we do for selfish purposes it just rivets one more link of ignorance upon ourselves but when we work for you know altruistically for the service of others for the welfare of others you can add bhakti to it as a worship of god by serving others then mind is purified now you have a nice matrix 3 by 3 matrix impure mind solution purity comes by karma yoga um, restless mind solution concentration comes by upasana which is gyana yoga which is bhakti yoga and raja yoga together and then ignorant mind solution is knowledge and that comes by gyana yoga note it is gyana yoga the path of knowledge which removes ignorance and gives you liberation you will realize i am brahman the others have supporting roles bhakti devotion has a supporting role uh, karma definitely has a supporting role not the main actor not the main player what am i talking about traditional approach to the four yogas in advaita vedanta this is the advaita vedanta paradigm notice what vivekananda says by one or more or all of these and be free would the traditional advaitin agree no i've heard very good masters of advaita criticizing vivekananda's approach he says he says that by one or more of course not not by one or more only by path of knowledge only by gyana we are not dismissing the importance of meditation we are not dismissing the importance of bhakti we are not dismissing the importance of karma but they are all preliminary they prepare the mind and the prepared mind will become enlightened through vedanta this is the traditional approach now what is the problem here the problem here is this only this nothing absolutely wrong with this. this is perfect it will work if you take this and you will become enlightened certainly and notice it does not dismiss the yogas it gives primacy to one but uh, puts all includes all the others they, they are absolutely necessary but they will not take you to the goal finally the problem here is this this is entirely built upon one philosophy the philosophy is you are brahman and you are ignorant of it ignorance is the problem and knowledge is the solution so yes of course what else not what else there are many many other traditions of the same upanishad same bhagavad gita there is the dvaita vedanta and vishishta dvaita vedanta and shuddha dvaita vedanta and dvaita dvaita vedanta more than a thousand years after shankara acharya of thousands and thousands of practitioners they have produced great saints men of uh, women of uh, enlightenment and realization who have motivated and inspired entire uh, civilizations what do they say is knowledge the final goal no they say devotion is the final goal by the path of bhakti yes what what will ramanujacharya say he say first of all uh, karma will purify the mind correct we agree then comes knowledge i am not the body and not the mind i am a spark of consciousness then comes devotion you are a spark of consciousness and god is the whole mass of consciousness he is the bonfire of of which you are a spark he is the whole of which you are a part you see how the metaphysical assumptions make the all the difference in practice uh-huh. advaita vedanta will put gyana at the top vishishta advaita and dvaita vedanta and they are in in the majority they will put devotion at the top and to hold on to this that gyana itself is the only way to god realization what do you have to do you have the unwelcome alternative unwelcome implication of saying all those others are wrong all those others are wrong that makes one a little uneasy all these traditions of devout men and women for thousands of years and such wonderful saints 
century after century. You, you just read their writing and you will feel inspired immediately. And you read the Vedanta, I'm, I'm an Advaitin. I'm saying read the Advaita, Advaita classics, you will fall asleep immediately. <laughs> so, can they be wrong? Can they be lesser? Can they be unenlightened? Mirabai, the great devotee, was she an Agyani? A person of ignorance? Of course not. Mirabai had the same realization as Adi Shankaracharya had. Adi Shankaracharya had the same bhakti as Mirabai had. So, if you want to take a step back and see the big picture, you can't insist on one paradigm, one structure. It, this works, but that also works. Why it works, why different structures work, we will see later. But it works. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu comes and says, only bhakti will take you to the goal. You don't have to worry so much about doing unselfish work and sitting and controlling the breath and meditating. Deep devotion, love for God will give you purity of mind, will concentrate your mind and will bring, bring about the grace of the Lord by which you will be free. So, it works. That is why Swami Vivekananda, he says by one or more or all of these. If you insist on holding on to one particular paradigm, perfectly welcome to do so. And it, it's, Swami Vivekananda has given a 100% stamp of approval. But saying that this is the only way and the others are not at all true, no. The justification for this Swamiji will give later. Why this, all these things work? Why not only one? So, Swami Vivekananda, then what does he recommend? He recommends a harmony of yogas. He says, by seeing the life of Sri Ramakrishna, I can see a person who is as liberal as the sky and as deep as the ocean. To be staunch, you don't have to be a fanatic. And to be liberal, you don't have to be superficial. You can be profound and deep and be liberal also. A person who is who manifests karma, action, who manifests devotion, who manifests knowledge, and who manifests meditation to the highest possible extent in one life, it is possible. Swami Vivekananda says, by seeing Sri, I've seen one such. Of course, if we look at Swami Vivekananda's life, we see one such. He is himself a manifestation of knowledge and devotion and, and meditation and work. We may not attain to that perfection in all of those, but Swami Vivekananda's great insight was it is actually easier if we uh, practice all together. And if, if it is satisfying for you as it is for me to have a particular structure that knowledge alone will liberate me at the end, fine. He has, at no point does he object to it. You have that. So, the harmony of the four yogas. And again, two more points. W one thing is that if you look at the texts themselves, if you look at a bhakti text like the Naradiya Bhakti Sutra, does the, does the Bhakti Sutra ever say, here we shall teach bhakti as a support, in the second level of the problem of Advaita Vedanta? No. He says we teach bhakti as a way to liberation, to attain God. If you take our yoga text, Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, anywhere does it say in sutras, that this is just you know like an uh, auxiliary kind of, you take this as, a, as an audit course. It's not a credit course. Yeah. Ultimately, you have to go to the Upanishad after this. Finish this course and then go to the Upanishads and attend Vedanta classes. No. Patanjali is very clear. By this method, you will attain uh, Kaivalya, liberation. Um, uh, Kapila is very clear. In the Ishwara Krishna Sankhya Karika, very clear that, that this little book alone will give you the uh, highest. So nobody ever says that we are part of a bigger scheme which is your scheme. No. You may include us as part of your scheme. Fine. Another thing. This fascination we have for meditation or philosophy or even devotion. It's often a misappraisal of ourselves. We hardly know the structure of our own minds, our own personalities. And what seems to us on the surface may not be the truth about us. The Guru sometimes knows much better about us than we know about ourselves. Swami Vivekananda himself says that you think I am uh, a jnani. I am jnana on the outside, but inside I am all bhakti. He says, I am as soft, I have a, as soft a heart as a woman's heart I have inside. I am all bhakti inside. 
Then he says, and, but the old man, he was bhakti outside, inside he was all jnana. <laughs> it's quite possible. I have seen closely in the lives of monks whom I met, um, advanced spiritual seekers, they seem one thing on the outside and they have a private, a very deep private inner spiritual life. So outside might seem very austere and forbi forbidding and very uh, severely philosophical and inside full of devotion and love, not expressed. So, harmony of the four yogas. There's more to be said. So many of these things which I'm saying here, I claim no originality to this uh, analysis. Uh, I'm firmly uh, basing myself as I'm just like a commentary on the works of the older masters. So he, what I'm saying here mostly comes from the writings of uh, Swami Bhajananandaji, uh, who is a very senior monk of our order, a very luminous mind, a very deep thinker. So right now what I was talking about, he wrote an article called The Yogas and Their Synthesis. is in Prabuddha Bharata. And he talks about why it is necessary to harmonize the four yogas. Why is it, how do you harmonize the four yogas? And he, for example, I'll give you a quickly, within a couple of sentences, what he says. He talks about vertical synthesis. Now what is this vertical synthesis? Vertical synthesis is one above the other. Just like we said, Shankaracharya or Advaita Vedanta says, first karma, then um, bhakti and yoga, and then jnana. This is vertical synthesis. Ramanuja says, first karma, then jnana, then, then bhakti, vertical synthesis. Or it could be a horizontal synthesis, he says. He says, uh, that's what most people do. And if you look at the life of a devotee or a Ramakrishna mission monk, so you get up early in the morning and meditate, and then you go and study, and then you go to work, and you know, serve humanity, and come back in the evening, and attend arati, and worship, and spend some time in meditation. Throughout the day, there are some meditative activities, there are some philosophical study activities, there is, a, there is something that you do to serve humanity, and there is devotion and ritual. The only problem with this is it's not integrated, and you will always feel a kind of um, a, a conflict of time and energy. Too much work, I can't meditate. Uh, too much meditation, you're selfish. <laughs> not doing other, enough for others. So this, this problem may be there. He talks about collective synthesis. This is based on Swami Vivekananda. We may not be perfect in each method, in each way, but in an ashram, in a household, in, in a community, there may be different mentalities, different personalities. Some may be meditative, more. And some may be devoted to service. Some may be very studious and uh, uh, you know, philosophical in their approach. Some may be ritualistic worshippers. This is literally true of what I saw in Belurmat. Uh, great Pujari, day and night chanting hymns and uh, even when he's, and he's year after year worshipping in the temple of Sri Ramakrishna, even when he's given a break, go and relax, the old monk. He goes on a pilgrimage in the railway, in the train, and in, uh, sitting in the train, he starts the worship. He has got his own little uh, image and little uh, worship toolkit, and he spreads it out before his. It becomes natural for him. I have seen Swamis day and night working for the welfare of the poor. Day and night. Hard work. Uh, I have seen Swamis who are so austere and engaged in uh, uh, Vedantic study. One Swami, I remember Swami Shikshanandaji, our teachers, when we were novices, they told, Shikshanandaji literally means <laughs> delight in, in Shiksha means education or knowledge and teaching. Uh, of course, for Vedic scholars, immediately they'll object because here the word Shiksha comes from a Vedic usage, which means the art of pronouncing Vedic mantras. Anyway, so this Swami, he was always engaged in Vedantic study. So our teachers at the, at the training center when we were brahmacharis, they said, go and see the Swami. What does it mean by studying? You, you only flip pages. You're flipping pages. You say you're reading books. No. Go and see the Swami. And so whenever we visited him, all the time, without fail, he'd be sitting in his easy, like an armchair, and he would have the commentary of Shankaracharya open before him, which he had studied for 75 years or more. It's not that he did not know every word in, the, in that book. 
but it's not that he's reading it to read new things and finish off books one after another you know, it's to keep his mind there in that that knowledge he would always be studying reading like this and if you bow down to him he'll note hmm and then back <laughs> so collective synthesis in the same it can be in an ashram it can be in a household uh, where a father mother children they can have their own different approaches to spiritual life so these are the different ways in which one can harmonize the four yogas swami vivekananda himself has asked how shall we harmonize the four yogas and swami vivekananda's answer was live with one who has harmonized the four yogas <laughs> I guess that's the right exact answer if you see such a person in action it's not an artificial way of you know planning out the routine this is my gyan yoga time this is my bhakti yoga time this is my, not that way yeah, it is uh, a natural synthesis where it will be very difficult to distinguish is this person being a devotee or a gyani or a karmi if you look closely at a great spiritual master they seem to be all the harmony of four yoga so this is one place where swami vivekananda says something has something new to give um i've run out of time i'll quickly mention two more areas and then uh, conclude another area is swami vivekananda's theory of ethics of morality the question here is what is right and what is wrong what should we do and what should we not do this is the classic question of ethics and the deeper question is why should we be good first of all what is good and what is bad and even deeper than this why should we be good what is good and what is bad is the realm of ethics or what they call normative ethics and the technical term for the second question why should i be good at all is called meta ethics you ask a question about ethics itself big big area there are volumes and volumes being written even till today uh, there are uh, you know oxford handbooks and rutledge handbooks and all on ethics It's a huge, huge issue. I was uh, lucky and privileged to be allowed to attend a uh, class by Professor Amartya Sen in at Harvard University. He was so he is a professor of both philosophy and economics at Harvard. So he he was teaching a course on ethics. So I was able to attend that that class. And all these classic questions they come up and see how much effort is being put into it by the finest minds of our civilization trying to come to an answer about this what is so difficult the difficulty is the difficult thing is how do you decide what is right and wrong not only for a person but for a community for a country for a government for the international community one way could be by consequence utilitarian ethics that uh, that which maximizes happiness is good that which reduces happiness or increases sorrow is bad immediately one might say no but by maximizing my happiness i might contribute to sorrow all around me so that can be modified maximizes the happiness of the entire community now, that which maximizes the happiness and satisfaction of the entire community and reduces misery that is good and these are not just theoretical things these are absolutely important for public policy taxation why do you why does every country tax the rich more than the poor because for the for a rich person to give up a thousand dollars the amount by giving up that money that person loses some amount of happiness but the amount of happiness that a multimillionaire or billionaire loses by giving up a thousand dollars in tax money that thousand dollars spent for very poor people the the amount of happiness they get from it by getting the essentials of life through government action is much more than the loss of one billionaire in a little bit of happiness that person loses so it makes sense to tax the rich more than the poor so these these are issues which are of great public uh, consequence economic consequence utilitarian well that seems fine then why at all um, bother you just follow this well, not so easy not so easy so one classic question that would would be asked in class would be that so maximizing happiness is the goal yes suppose you have a a, a terrorist you have, you have got a terrorist who has planted a bomb and you want him to say where the where is the bomb uh, the terrorist is a hardened fellow he refuses to confess would you torture him mm -hmm. said so, so many people they raise their hands here yeah, because it will save the life say if you if he confesses it will save the lives of 50 people or 100 people yes yes maybe we have to torture some people many people are not and uh, many people are unsure then the professor will say he will tighten the screw <laughs> he will say um even after torturing the person does not confess 
He's very hardened. He has a little five-year-old daughter. Will you torture that daughter in front of the father to make the father confess? So many people who had raised their hands put their hands down. <laughs> now, 50 people will die. 100 people will die. Will you torture one little child? Logically, yes. But it doesn't seem right at all. It seems awful. Yes. They used to war game this uh, rand. You know, war game this uh, nuclear uh, warfare. Uh, computers and human beings, there would be like committees to decide whether to launch nuclear strike. You know, USA should, should it launch a nuclear tri strike on the erstwhile Soviet Union. And they found at that, the verge of the decision making about to launch a nuclear strike, which will wipe out all of humanity, human decision makers always hesitated. Computers never hesitated. They did exactly what was rational. Next step, wipe out humanity. Go ahead. <laughs> because utilitarian ethics, hmm. something will serve. That if you can make the logic so, you have to follow it then. No, that does not seem right. Then what is the alternative? Deontological ethics. And deontological ethics is a fancy name. It just means law or my religion says so. My religion says you will not fight in a war. So right, wrong, whatever it is, I will not fight. My religion says this. So the problem with that will be, suppose I don't believe in that religion then. Each religion has different things which it prescribes. Or the law of the land says it. The law of the land says you must do this, you must not, not do that. It's not a question of what is the consequence. It's the law is that. So it depends on the kind of person. You're know, crossing the road. The light is not changed yet, but there's nobody around. So in India, you'll just walk across. <laughs> and I've heard, I've not been there. In Germany, never. Why? There's no, no, no problem at all. It is the rule. <laughs> you stay, stand there until the light changes. Even in this heavy snow, you'll stand there and cross. That is a deontological ethics. This is utilitarian ethics. What is the effect of it? What is Swami Vivekananda's answer to this whole quandary? This Vedantic ethics. Swami Bhajananji has written a beautiful 20-page article on this. I gave a talk about 14-15 um, years ago at the University of Calcutta to a group of professors. It was the last talk of the day. And I gave a talk on this uh, article by Swami Bhajananji on the ethics, the theory of ethics of Swami Vivekananda. They liked it so much, they wanted photocopies of that article. I still remember the photocopier section was closed and the guy wanted to go home. It was five o'clock. But they held him up there and until everybody got a copy of that article. It's called Swami Vivekananda's Ontological Ethics. So what is ontological? Ontos is the word for being, existence, reality. Based on the reality of the Atman, ethics. Swami Vivekananda says, why be ethical? Question, why should I be ethical? It's because we are one reality. By hurting the other person, you're hurting yourself. It follows from the divinity of the, of the soul, the divinity within us, and the oneness of all existence. Ethics follows from that. Not because of consequence. Not because somebody imposed it. Not because this book says so. Not because the law of the land says so. It is your very nature to be ethical. Being ethical, being moral is an expression of your deepest nature. It is an expression of the nature of the Atman, of yourself. Theory of evil. Why is there suffering and evil in the, in the world? This is part of ethics. Did Satan do it? Is another power, evil power? Or in uh, Indian religions, it was karma. It is our accumulated karma which is, the, which is causing all this evil in the world. In Christian theology, it is the wrong use of free will. God has given us free will and we misuse it and therefore there is evil in the world. Swami Vivekananda says, from a Vedantic perspective, it is ignorance which is the cause of evil. It is not sin. Now, another theory is that its original sin is the cause of evil. Swami Vivekananda said, no, it is not sin, not even karma. Ultimately, the cause of evil is the ignorance of the real nature of the self. This theory of ethics, what does it lead to? This is from freedom. Ethics comes from freedom. We are free of the lower self. We are the uh, existence consciousness bliss right now. The so-called body-mind self is an appearance. So this evil 
uh, this this uh, lack of ethics is because of holding on to what is an appearance. It's not true. We are free of it. An expression of our freedom is uh, ethics. It's not something imposed from outside. How do we know the question? What is right? What is wrong? How will we find out? Vivekananda gives wonderful methods to de determine. He says that which is unselfish is moral. That which is selfish is immoral. One way of testing. That which unifies is moral. That which divides is immoral. Another way of testing. And notice how it is all uh, connected to the oneness of all existence. Why unselfishness? Because we are one. Why unity? Because we are all one. Ultimately. And this unity itself, unity of all existence itself is manifested as love. Ethics is grounded in love. Another consequence of Swami Vivekananda's ethics is service. Love must be expressed in service to others. How do you express ethics in service to others, those who need it? Another consequence, equality. We are all equal. Not because of this revolution, not that for political philosopher. Not because of the brotherhood or sisterhood. Deeper than brotherhood and sisterhood. Deeper than communism and capitalism. Deeper than even physics and biology. Is the oneness of all existences, that one existence consciousness place in all beings. He's, Swami Vivekananda says, from the Nazarene to the worm, to yonder worm, is one divinity shining through all. And therefore we are all equal. All this fight for racial equality, gender equality, you know, it, it comes because we are struggling at the level of the body to establish equality. At the deepest level, there already is equality, there is oneness. And yet Swami Vivekananda does not erase difference. He enjoys difference. There is difference. There are differences of gender, there are differences of, uh, of uh, uh, religion and uh, of um, race. And it's all wonderful. Then how do, what, if oneness is the reality, then all these differences and appearance, what do you do at the level of appearance? You cannot erase difference here and you should not. So the answer is harmony. Harmony, a very big word in Swami Vivekananda's lexicon. Harmony of religions, yeah. harmony of philosophies, harmony between science and religion, harmony between the nations, harmony between the genders today you will see, harmony between the races, harmony. Another consequence of Swami Vivekananda's ethics is um, uh, strength. It's something you come across again and again and again. Uh, Anybody who came in contact with Vivekananda, the first effect was they were uplifted. Josephine MacLeod writes that when I met the Tsar of Russia, I felt how great he is and how insignificant I am. But when I met Vivekananda, I felt how great he is and how great I am. That was the effect, like a tonic. He would uplift even the most crushed spirits. So strength, physical strength, moral strength, emotional strength, intellectual strength. Spiritual strength, above all. He says, so Vivekananda says, he connects weakness to evil. Unethical life, evil, unhappiness, misery is connected to weakness because we are too weak to put our ideals into practice. So we must strengthen ourselves to live spirituality. And finally, ethics is the basis, the foundation of spirituality. Ethics itself is not the end of life. Ethics, moral, good life is the a basis for spiritual life. To ultimate, you know, the, the prize at the end of the road is infinity. Your own nature that is there only if we lead an ethical, moral life. So this is Swami Vivekananda's contribution to the field of ethics. Huge, huge thing. And still not uh, appreciated. I can, I was, one takeaway from that course which I attended, Professor Amartya Sen's course, how many of those questions which were raised and wrestled over by some of the smartest minds it's not just Professor Amartya Sen, but I saw a professor of mathematics whose books I have in my library is sitting next to me. He's there attending the class. I thought he looks familiar. Who is he? I seen him in the back of back cover of a book which I possess. <laughs> They're sitting there and, and and wrestling with these these questions. I'm not saying that there's ultimate solution which is given by Vivekananda and everything's done, but it is really a, a path-breaking, fundamental contribution to the field of ethics, which Swami Vivekananda said. I'm, I'm sure in time it will become more developed. And finally, the harmony of religions. 
I will not speak more about it, but just touch upon the essentials. It all comes directly from Swami, uh, from Sri Ramakrishna, from his guru. How is all these these yogas, multiple structures, possible? Uh, by jnana, we'll get freedom. By bhakti, you will get freedom. How is it possible? Uh, by all these paths, you will reach the same goal. How is it possible? We, we are right here. The truth is one. The sages speak about it differently. Ekam sad vipra bahuda vadanti. This is from the Rig Veda. How is it possible to speak about it differently if the truth is one? Why not speak about it the same way? Why do different religions say different things? Here is what Swami Vivekananda brings from Sri Ramakrishna. That the ultimate reality is infinite. One. So Sri Ramakrishna's beautiful example of the ant which went to eat uh, sugar and he found a mountain of sugar and dragged a little bit of the sugar and looked back and said, I'm going to take the whole mountain with me. He cannot and he need not. That little bit of sugar is enough. So the infinite reality, you take, you express every religion, philosophy, enlightened person expresses just a little bit of it. Second, it cannot be expressed in language. But it must be expressed in language. So when you try to express the inexpressible in language, you do not give a complete account of it. It's an imperfect grasp on that reality. Avang manasagochara, <coughs> beyond conception, beyond language. Sri Ramakrishna used to say, Brahman is the only thing in Bengali, he said, So eto is very difficult to translate into English, which has not been defiled by the tongue. So because it cannot be expressed in language and because it is infinite, Therefore, multiple expressions are possible. It seems very simple, but it's a very big insight. That's, the, that's where harmony of religions can be established. It makes it possible to have many religions without saying one must be true, others must be false. No. Then what happens? Suppose you have this infinite God beyond language. The purpose of human life is God-realization. And the purpose of religion is to be a path to God-realization. Is Vivekananda made it very clear that these religions are like different paths up the mountainside. Paths are different. One path is different from the other doesn't mean they are wrong. If both take you to the same goal, both are correct. Again from Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna says in different ways you can reach the roof of the house. The Brahmo devotees have come. Sri Ramakrishna says, look, some of you came by coach, some of you came by boat, some of you walked, but ultimately you all got here. In the same way, people are following different faiths will all reach the same divinity. This is how harmony is, is uh, realized. So Ramakrishna's beautiful example of people going to the same la- the pond and calling it water and pani and jal, but they're talking about the same reality. Forms and formlessness, which Sister Nivedita said. Beautiful example, ice and water. By the coolness of the devotion, Water freezes. The water, formless Brahman freezes as it were into the ice of different forms of gods and goddesses. When the sun of knowledge rises, it melts back into the same water. But whether, you don't have to melt, melt it back. Whether you are worshipping in a form or whether you are worshipping formless, it's the same reality. One and the many are the same reality. What follows from this? That at the same time, one must have uh, dedication to one's own path. This is called Ishta Nishta. Sri Ramakrishna used to say, Bhav Nashta Kotteni, do not disturb anybody's spiritual attitude. Somebody is built up. I have devotion to Krishna. Now don't come to this person and say, oh, but it is just a form. Ultimately, it is formlessness and you must shift from Krishna to the formlessness. No, you don't have to do that. Respect the spiritual attitude of everybody and have your own spiritual attitude. But know all the time, these are all different paths to the same real, realization. Therefore, so Vivekananda added, there is no need to convert. The big drive to convert from one religion to another, unnecessary. Yeah. And we can, this is the religions of the world are not contradictory. They are complementary to each other. And because they are complementary to each other, we can all learn from each other. Just yesterday we had a wonderful talk by Professor Clooney from Harvard and he has studied the Hindu classics and the Christian classics. He's a practicing Jesuit priest. Hindu classics and the Christian class, Catholic classics he's reading together and he is, his own spiritual life is benefited by this and he shares it with, with others. And whatever anybody might say, the world that Swami Vivekananda envisaged 
is already here. You may agree or disagree. Neither God cares nor Vivekananda cares. <laughs> the work has already been done. People are more or less like this now. Large numbers of people, especially ordinary people across the world. I'm not talking about theologians and professors. Um, ordinary people, they do agree that there are multiple paths to realization. They do agree that spirituality is a, is a serious and important goal of life. They do agree that we can learn from different paths. Uh, Professor Clooney yesterday was saying that students at the Divinity School come and say, I really don't know who I am. I am born Christian, but I'm a little bit Buddhist also. And I'm a little bit this and a little bit that also. And definitely I'm a humanist also. And that is what Vivekananda envisaged. That is what has happened. So I've gone well over time. But the theme here was just an exploration of what is old and what is new in Swami Vivekananda. I hope by this time we have seen that these categories of old and new are interesting ways of looking at it, but they're not at all contradictory. Whatever Swami Vivekananda has done is firmly rooted in Advaita Vedanta. And yet there are implications, new ways of presentation and new insights and a new vision which has come through Swami Vivekananda. I pray to Sri Ramakrishna, Ma Sharada and Swami Vivekananda to bless us, to bless us all, this beautiful city, this country, the whole world and the civilization to come yet. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Rupa Namastu